1976, Marvel and DC collaborated on the oversized battle of the century between Superman and Spider-Man. It was a success. Such a success, in fact, that they decided to release a second instalment. Being a second instalment, it needed something extra that the first didn't have. Perhaps a couple of guest stars. One from either publisher. Maybe they've both had wildly popular TV shows recently. Maybe one is a woman. Maybe one is known for having anger management issues. After the success of the Battle of the Century, Marvel and DC signed a deal to produce more crossovers. Three in 1981 1982 alone. To come were Batman vs. The Incredible Hulk and the X Men and Teen Titans. But first, they were going to stick with the pairing that had already brought them success. Spider Man had been Marvel's most popular character since he first appeared in 1962. Although, due to seminal work from the likes of Frank Miller, Alan Moore, and I suppose Tim Burton, Batman would end the 1980s as DC's most popular character. In 1981, it was still the Big Blue Boy Scout. The first Superman-Spider-Man crossover had big arch enemies for both characters. For Spider-Man, it was Doctor Octopus. For Superman, it was Lex Luthor. So for this second outing, who do you think they went for for Superman? Brainiac? No. General Zod? Nope. Mr. What's-His-Face? No siree. Instead, they decided to go with the Parasite. Weird, huh? Don't get me wrong, I think the Parasite, his look, his powers, all of that, is really cool. But it just seems a bit odd to go for a lesser known enemy of Superman. That said, apparently the writer Jim Shooter did want enemies that would help drive the story, rather than having that recognition factor. It was the 1980s, so of course Marvel's villain of choice was Doctor Doom. Now he and Spider-Man had tangled before, but no one would really call him a Spider-Man villain. We're all very familiar with Doctor Doom, but the Parasite, maybe not so much. So to get a bit of background on him, let's have a look at Superman, issue 322. Yeah, that's right, the distinguished competition. This issue is the last part of a storyline that saw the Parasite trick Superman into thinking that his powers had been increased, if you can imagine such a thing, and then tricked him into using a kind of super suntan lotion to block out the sun's rays to make him weaker, whilst the Parasite then tried to steal the rest of his powers. It marked the last time that these two characters clashed before the crossover with Spider-Man, although that crossover was out of continuity, so who knows the last time when that Superman and that Parasite clashed. It was written by Canadian Martin Pasco. He wrote a whole stack of Superman stories, not just for the comics, but also for the newspaper strip and the 1988 cartoon series. He wrote on many other cartoon series as well, including Thunder the Barbarian, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Bucky O'Hare, Batman, The Mask of Phantasm, and many, many more, including My Little Pony. He was also a writer on classic 80s science fiction series, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Even if you've never read any DC comics, you may still know the name Kurt Swan. He has drawn more Superman stories than anybody else, providing art for the comics for over three decades, from 1950s to the mid-1980s. And not just on the two main Superman titles, but also on comics such as Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane and Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. He also drew a number of issues featuring Superboy. So, before we go to the main event, let's have a look and see what we can expect from The Parasite. The Parasite is going to use a satellite defence system to destroy Metropolis, unless he's paid a billion dollars by midday. Superman, due to his super suntan lotion, is plummeting powerless towards the Earth. Naturally, we have a page of recap, but we also have a whole page of Superman's really convoluted thought process, whereby he works out that actually uh, he does have some of his powers left. And the thing to do is to take his boots off because he didn't put any of the super suntan lotion on his feet. So that should mean he is able to absorb some power from the sun before he falls to his death. His plan works, although he is still knocked unconscious. Whilst he's out of it, we can talk a little bit about the LDS system. Now this is a lot like Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program of the 1980s. Not that Star Wars, kids. Um, which is an orbital defence system for planet Earth, although of course 
a little bit more advanced than what actually happened in the real world. It's going to be tested and for this test there is what they call a missile but it looks really like a space shuttle. It's going to fire a high powered laser at the LDS system and that's strong enough to destroy a city. But the LDS system will detect it and uh, bounce the laser back at its source destroying um, what must be millions and millions of pounds worth of equipment. But apparently that's the way the test is done. The power site's plan is he's now adjusted it so that laser will bounce off of the LDS system and head straight to Metropolis and destroy the whole city. The test is going to go ahead. The only way they can stop it going ahead is by using the manual override but Superman destroyed the manual override in the previous issue when he was going a bit nuts because he thought his powers were out of control. Speaking of Superman, he's now back at his apartment and he got there by taking the bus because until he regains his powers, he can't fly. So he's now in the shower, uh, washing off the last of the super suntan lotion. And he can feel his powers coming back already and he tests them on the shower door. Is that the best way to test if your powers are back? He's satisfied with it. He says that before he finds the power site, he's going to stop off at the Fortress of Solitude and I assume a local DIY store to buy a new shower screen. We then go to Mooney Island and Mooney Island is where the controls for the satellite system are located. The power site, using heat vision powers that he stole from Superman, melts the soil and grass around the feet of the guards uh, so they sink into it and he can enter the site unopposed. Melting the soil and the grass? Is that possible? Elsewhere, the billion dollar ransom money is on its way to Mooney Island, to the parasite, but it may be too late. The parasite is poised to push the button that will send the laser towards Metropolis. Superman is also on his way, but he may also be too late, and it looks like he will be too late. In fact, he decides there isn't enough time to get into the Mooney Island base uh, to stop parasite pushing the button. So instead, he dives into the ocean deep beneath the ocean to the seabed. Then, as the laser from the LDS is earthbound heading towards Metropolis, Superman pushes the entire planet slightly out of the way so that the laser misses. Clearly, that was a much easier option than just landing at the Mooney Island Lighthouse and taking out the parasite. Speaking of the parasite, he realizes his plan has gone awry, but nonetheless, he still tries to steal the $1 billion from the people that were flying it out to the island via helicopter. However, Superman intervenes and stops him. And from this point on, Superman has the upper hand. There is one point uh, briefly where the parasite touches him and steals a bit more of his power, and he thinks that that's weakened Superman enough so that he can wrap him in a steel fence uh, and keep him trapped. Well, Superman's just pushed the entire planet and the parasite knows that because when he went to steal the one billion dollars he even said for while superman may have done me out of my destruction of the city so somehow he knew what superman had done god knows how so there's no way that even a slightly weakened superman or even a massively weakened superman would be held in place by a steel fence and indeed he isn't held in place by that steel fence and once superman breaks free he and the parasite uh, have a brief airborne skirmish where they attack each other with their heat vision, making good on the promise of the cover. And Superman is doing this on purpose because he wants the parasite to kind of depower himself. And indeed, the powers that the parasite has stolen do begin to fade. And he lands on a roller coaster at a fairground. And now we've got a really weird bit because Superman punches. Uh, a little car on the roller coaster up towards the power site. It hits him and it knocks him out briefly. Then he comes to and we see him crawling up the roller coaster towards the figure of Superman, who for some reason, although he is kind of chiding the power site, uh, has got his back to him and looking away. That's rather odd. But then we discover why that's happening because it isn't Superman at all, it's Solomon Grundy. Where did he come from, I hear you ask? Well, a couple of issues ago, uh, Superman had a run-in with him. And then early on in this issue, Superman flies past a cable car uh, and sees Solomon Grundy standing up there because Solomon Grundy wants to fly and he can't fly. And he's just been standing on this cable car, apparently, since they last uh, had that little run-in. Then, 
whilst the parasite was unconscious because of the uh, roller coaster car hitting him, Superman went, got Solomon Grundy, brought him back, and told him this little plan pretend you're me, etc. etc. So now the parasite gets to who he thought was Superman, discovers uh, the deception, and he says, Oh no, because it's Solomon Grundy. Well, surely Solomon Grundy isn't more powerful than Superman. So, okay, you may not want to fight Solomon Grundy, but I'd actually be quite happy to go, oh, that's a result. I thought you were Superman. Let's get it on. Nonetheless, Solomon Grundy uh, delivers the final blow to Parasite, knocking him out. And Superman uh, comes back and he fulfills his part of the bargain because the way that he got Solomon Grundy to help him out was that he would promise that he would help him fly. And he does this by taking him to another planet where the gravity uh, is much lighter than Earth. So Solomon Grundy can fly around to his heart's content on a barren, desolate, unpopulated planet. He seems happy. Solomon Grundy is happy. The parasite is in custody. And we do have one more page uh, where we have a bit of a romantic interlude between Superman and Lois Lane. But other than that, our tale is at an end. Let's return to this big boy. Despite having a cover that was drawn by John Romita Sr. and painted by Bob Larkin, the interior art was produced by the pencil of Big John Buscema, a guy who despite being mentioned on seemingly every single episode of this show, rarely got to draw Marvel's number one star. The writer was the controversial Jim Shooter. He was 30 when this came out, but he was already an experienced writer, having started his career at the age of 13. Those early years were spent working for DC before he left and joined Marvel, and The Parasite was actually one of his creations. In 1978, he became editor-in-chief of Marvel and oversaw a period that included some legendary runs on titles such as The Fantastic Four, X-Men, Spider-Man and Thor, not to mention his own work on the likes of Secret Wars and the New Universe imprint. However, relationships between him and other members of Marvel's staff deteriorated to the degree that in 1987 he was replaced in his role by Tom DeFalco and effectively fired by Marvel. He then went on to launch a handful of comic book publishers, the first and most successful of which was Valiant Comics. You may have noticed that this is an oversized comic, commonly referred to as a treasury edition. They had about a decade in the sun, starting in the 1970s but waning in popularity as the 80s progressed. This is actually the 28th and final release in the Marvel Treasury Edition series. And it's something of a rarity because it contains original work rather than the usual reprints that that series relied on. After this came out, producing comics in this format became a real rarity. It's a big comic with big characters. So let's see the big review. When artists used to work on these large Treasury Editions, I do think that sometimes they felt they had to fill the big pages with big pictures. For example, Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk at the Winter Olympics contained uh, several double page splashes. Um, or even if it wasn't a double page splash, it would be a big picture of the Hulk uh, filling the whole of the page. John Buscema in this one uh, takes a very different approach. For a start, there are no double page splashes at all. And there's only one full uh, single page splash. And that's the very first page where we see Spider-Man swinging into the scene. But even there, he isn't filling the whole of the page, although he is still central to the image. But it's as though the camera has panned out and we see more of his environment rather than just him on a larger scale. So we see things like the brickwork uh, behind him, the bank robbers, the would-be bank robbers down below, the little buildings that are attached to the building site uh, where the bank robbers have managed to gain entry uh, through the wall into the bank. Other than that, the only thing that really sets these bank robbers apart from the normal kind of bank robbers is that they are armed with laser rifles that have computer sights. Nonetheless, Spidey clears up, but as he does so, he mentions things such as his employer, J. Jonah Jameson. Um, hopefully, it's going to pay him a good uh, rate for the photos he's taking because he's got rent to pay, all that kind of thing. The very down-to-earth elements of Peter Parker's life that long time or even casual Spider-Man fans will be very familiar with. But of course, it could be that these are Superman fans reading about Spider-Man for the very first time. We also have that other Spider-Man trope, which is that authorities, particularly the police, don't trust him. But it's not the police he has to worry about because he is being watched 
by unseen eyes. And those eyes belong to none other than Doctor Doom. So why is Doctor Doom watching anyway? Well, it's because the construction site belongs to him. And there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. So he tells us anyway. The laser rifles that are being used by the robbers, they were also designed uh, and manufactured by Doom. But what he's done, he made those guns and sent them out into the underworld just to see how they would operate in uh, battle conditions, if you like. Other than that, it's a pure coincidence that those robbers using his guns chose that bank beside his construction site to try to rob. Incredible coincidence. He then explains a bit about his background, um, his motivations in life, because of course these could be DC readers learning about Doom for the very first time. And then he asks for an update on the progress of Operation H. What does H stand for? It stands for Hulk. And it seems that Operation H is going well, because under their guidance, the Hulk has reached the outskirts of Metropolis, and he's approximately 30 kilometers from something they call the trigger point. Next, we see a bit more of Peter Parker's background. We see him uh, at ESU um, trying to chat up some young girl who turns out to not be interested because he doesn't have any money. Better off out of it, mate. And then he thinks about money and the fact that he needs more money to pay for Aunt May's last hospital stay. So again, all of these uh, tropes, these uh, cliches, if you like, for Peter Parker's background being introduced to all these possible new readers. Later on in the offices of the Daily Bugle, we see Jonah Jameson flicking through Peter's latest photos of Spider-Man, but it's nothing new. He's seen it all before. He's not interested. What he would be interested in is the fact that the Hulk has been sighted heading towards Metropolis, where that other self-styled do-gooder, Superman, uh, is based. And Jameson would be very interested in getting pictures of those two going head to head. And it's interesting that nobody even bats an eyelid at mention of Metropolis here, because in this world, Metropolis exists on the same planet as Peter Parker's New York. Enough of Marvel already. What about the DC side of this story? Well, Lois Lane and Clark Kent are in a helicopter on their way to where the Hulk was last spotted, which is at a place called Glendale. He's no longer there, but the visit does again show off this large format really well, because look at that for a scene of devastation. Clark Kent sees that the civil authorities really have got this all under control. And as the Hulk isn't even there, he doesn't see any reason to get involved in a, a Superman context. So him and Lois head back to the offices. And these are the offices uh, of GalaxyCon, because at this point, he doesn't just work for the Daily Planet, but there's also broadcast news that he's involved in. And we see the whole team, including Lois Lane, Lana Lang at this point, and also Joker, uh, Steve Lombard. It's during a meeting between all these people that Clark Kent looks through the wall and sees that the Hulk has now arrived in Metropolis. He then uses his skill of super ventriloquism to throw his voice so it sounds like somebody in the corridor outside where they're having the meeting is shouting, run, the Hulk is right outside the building. He then stamps on the floor, causing the whole building to shake so that everybody there thinks the Hulk is trying to tear the building down. In the ensuing confusion and chaos of everybody evacuating, he manages to change into Superman. And not a moment too soon, because the Hulk is causing carnage out there. And we're told he's being driven on. He's being goaded into a frenzy by something sinister. Superman arrives, and for a few pages we have a really good toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe slugfest. We've got the Hulk throwing big objects, or even himself, at Superman got Peter Parker getting off of a bus nearby, seeing what's going on and thinking, uh-uh, I need to change, I need to get involved. Superman, um, has he hit him there or has he thrown him? It looks like he's thrown him to me. But anyway, uh, he thinks that that should take the Hulk out of the fight, but it doesn't because the next thing we see, the Hulk punches Superman and he lands miles away. Left on his own, the Hulk can hear some irritating noise at his feet. So he tries to smash the noise because that's what he does. And the whole building shakes. At that point, Spidey turns up and he's thinking, oh boy, I don't really want to take this guy on, but what choice do I have? He does have a choice because Superman then returns. <sighs> I don't really want to talk about what happens next. I don't even want to show you this picture because it, it just irritates me. Okay, 
Okay, let's do it. You can see that the Hulk isn't holding back. He's hitting him with everything he's got. And Superman isn't even flinching or, or recoiling or going, oh, that hurt. He's just standing perfectly still. It is ridiculous. Especially as only a couple of pages ago, Superman himself said, how can anything mortal be that strong? And this really highlights the difference in approach between DC and Marvel to their superheroes. The DC heroes have always been, uh, and more so in the past, I know, not so much these days, but still, they've been so overpowered. And this essentially is the Silver Age Superman, who was stupendously powerful. This comic came out in 1981, so it isn't the Silver Age, but the character didn't really change, not until John Byrne got on board uh, in the mid-1980s, revamped the character and dialed down his powers. Thank God. Because this is just ridiculous. The Hulk in the world of Marvel, the Hulk is the strongest there is. And I think he should be. He should be stronger than Superman. But Superman has all these other powers, doesn't he? So, yeah, I think Superman should win. But it should look like it was a bit of a struggle. Now, they've fought on other occasions as well, these two. The Hulk fought Superman in the Marvel vs DC limited series. And Superman won. Fair enough, I don't have an issue with that. But he did at least look like he had been in a fight. It did look like it wasn't easy. Superman also once fought Thor in the JLA Avengers series. Again, he won. But again, it wasn't easy. It was a struggle. By the end of both of those two other battles, he looked like he'd been in a fight by the end of them. His clothing was even torn. Here, it continues. Hulk even points out, the madder Hulk gets, the stronger Hulk gets. And he gets madder and madder and madder. And he pummels Superman again and again. But it's no big deal. Superman just stands there. Ultimately, Superman spots a tiny little drone uh, emitting a sound whizzing around the Hulk's head. And using his super speed, he grabs that drone. And then using uh, his heat vision, he destroys it. And that stops irritating the Hulk, stops driving him on. And slowly but surely, the Hulk calms down and reverts to Bruce Banner. Spider-Man slips away and changes back into his civilian clothing. Superman uh, sends Bruce Banner off to be looked after at Star Labs, and he wants to investigate where that drone came from. Meanwhile, in the rubble left behind by the battle, we see the parasite. He was being held in an underground prison cell, but he's now free, and it's all thanks to Dr. Doom. It was Doom who arranged for the Hulk to make his way to Metropolis. And you remember when the Hulk was smashing the ground to try to stop that irritating noise? Where well, he was hitting the ground in the precise point, which meant it would crack open the cell that Parasite was being held in, miles below ground. And now the Parasite is out. However, another part of Doom's plan was for Superman to still be there when the Parasite got out of his cell so he could feed off of Superman's energy. But Superman isn't there. However, Peter Parker is. So the Parasite drains some of his power. At that point, as Peter Parker is feeling giddy, he crosses paths with Jimmy Olsen. They hit it off quite well, and Jimmy Olsen says, let me give you a tour of my newsroom. And during that tour, he meets all the various uh, characters from the Daily Planet and the TV station, including Lois Lane, Lana Lang. He has met Lois Lane before, and he remembers that. That was from the 1976 Battle of the Century. He meets uh, Perry White, who he thinks, is a really nice guy compared to Jonah Jameson. Who isn't compared to Jonah Jameson? Meanwhile, Superman has found out that the parasite is free and he wants to find out how that happened. So he flies to New York where he's going to speak to the only other person in the world clever enough to mastermind the parasite's escape other than Lex Luthor. And that person is Dr. Doom. Doom denies being up to anything other than gaining absolute dominion over the entire planet. And then he compares himself to Superman before then hitting Superman with a kryptonite ray. While Superman is struggling against that, he realizes that the floors are lead lined. Dr. Doom lined the floors and the walls in lead so that Superman couldn't see through them with his X-ray vision. But that works to his benefit now because he tears up the floor, rolls himself in it like a carpet and then spins at super speed uh, so the lead melts, uh, forms around his body and produces a thin, flexible covering. Then, covered in lead, he grabs hold of the kryptonite rock that's powering the ray and hurls it, not only out of the building, 
not only out of the atmosphere, but all the way into the heart of the sun. With that threat out of the way, Superman breaks out of his little lead lining and he wants to smash Doom's face in. However, despite the fact they're in New York, they are in the Latvian embassy. And if he were to lay hands upon Doom, that would be breaking the law and cause some kind of diplomatic incident, which of course Superman won't do. So he leaves, but he says he'll be keeping an eye on Doom. If only he kept an eye on him a little bit longer, he would see that the parasite was also there at the embassy. Whilst in New York, Clark Kent visits the offices of the Daily Bugle and says he wants to join them for an attachment. The real motivation behind this is because he wants to keep the likes of the parasite away from his loved ones back in Metropolis. Whilst in New York, he does what Superman does. He sets about fighting crime and saving lives. After a couple of days, he heads over to Latveria to try to investigate, see what he can find out. But he doesn't see anything out of the ordinary there apart from another construction site. What he doesn't realise is whilst he's there, he's hit by an invisible particle beam, the purpose of which we will find out later in the issue. Returning to New York, he walks into a local police station uh, and he wants to have a look at the guns. Because you remember the laser guns from the bank robbery earlier on in the issue? Well, they're being held at this station and he wants to have a look at them. They can't allow that without a permit. And he says, fine, I don't, want, I don't want you to break the rules for me. So I'll just look at them through this wall. Back at Doom's base, we see he has the Hulk captured in a stasis tube. You remember that Bruce Banner was turned over to Star Labs. However, Doom sent a group of his goons there to liberate him. And now he has the Hulk. There's another stasis tube beside him that's empty. And he tells the parasite that that is for his next specimen. He won't tell the parasite exactly who the specimen is or why he wants both of these people. And so the parasite begins to get the hump and say, look, you gotta let me in, we're supposed to be equal. Of course, Doom doesn't see anybody as his equal. Parasite says, right, I'm gonna drain you and you'll beg me uh, to end it. He then discovers he can't drain Doom because Doom has insulated his armor against the parasite's powers. So it gives him a little zap to keep him in his place. And from there, we head back to see what Peter Parker is up to at the offices of the Daily Planet. He certainly had better days. He tries his charm on Lana Lang and gets nowhere, which is a fact that Steve Lombard uh, revels in. Later on, when Spidey is out web swinging, he comes across another construction site that sets off his spider sense. Now you remember that at this point, Spidey is in Metropolis, not New York. Nonetheless, he has the same feeling about this construction site as the one in New York. And his spider sense leads him to a trapdoor. And beneath the trapdoor, he finds a subterranean base. He finds a load of unconscious goons and he can hear a fight. Investigating, he sees who it is that is knocking out all these goons. It's only Wonder Woman. She's been lured there to Metropolis by Doctor Doom because this is his base and those are his goons that she's making mincemeat out of. She then sees Spider-Man and of course she assumes that he is a baddie. She assumes that he's working for Doctor Doom. And it's funny because when he sees her, he thinks, she used to live in New York. It's strange that we never ran into each other there. Oh well, it's a big town, which is a nice little knowing wink to the reader and an acknowledgement of the fact that in their respective universes, they both live or did live in New York. And yet, of course, they didn't cross paths. I think Cyborg says something similar in the uh, X-Men Teen Titans crossover uh, in the following year. There's a brief fight, although really it's Wonder Woman that's doing the fighting because she thinks that Spider-Man, uh, like I said, is employed by Doom and he's trying to persuade her otherwise. Eventually, uh, he pulls the plug on the lights and in the darkness, her glow-in-the-dark lariat uh, is a bit of a disadvantage, which he points out and says, look, if I was a baddie, I could attack you now, couldn't I? But I'm not. So she says, okay, she believes him. However, more of Doom's goons arrive at that point and start shooting and they hit Wonder Woman. Spider-Man can't make any headway against that barrage of laser guns. So as they drag Wonder Woman away, he makes good his escape. They put her on a subway train built by Doom that is gonna run all the way from Metropolis straight to New York. And as it pulls away, we see that Spidey is stuck to the back of it. 
Sometime later, we see that subway train arrive at the New York end of Doom's base. Wonder Woman is dragged out, and we see that Parasite is desperate to get his hands on her to drain her of her power. But Doom again stops him. Parasite then explains his origin to Doom, and somehow this elicits some kind of compassion, believe it or not, within Doctor Doom. So he agrees he will tell the Parasite what his plan is. He then brings up this big map of the planet, and all these little markers show where all of the construction sites, and we've seen a few of them in this comic, are spaced around the world. And is that Great Britain? I think it is. If so, it appears to have drifted away from Europe about 40 years too early. <laughs> the plan is the machinery that is underneath all of these construction sites marked on the map, as soon as Doom triggers them, they will turn all of the world's fossil fuels into dust. And then there'll be another trigger and it will destroy all the world's atomic power. We're not sure how. Then Doom and only Doom will have the world's only source of energy because he's built a huge fusion reactor. The Parasite will be second only to Doom because the Parasite will steal the powers of the likes of the Hulk, Wonder Woman and Superman so that nobody can oppose them. But again, we see the growing seeds of discontent between those two, as the Parasite thinks once he has all that power, he won't need Doctor Doom. Spider-Man has overheard all of this and he finds his way out of the complex, and as soon as he does, back at the original construction site in New York, he sees Superman. Tell Superman what's happening, so Soup says, okay, this sounds like a job for me. You stay here, stay safe, I'll go and deal with it. Briefly, Spider agrees with him, until he decides, no, I do have something to offer, and he follows him down into the complex. Once we're in the base, it's action all the way. Superman deals with the power site, and then he is attacked by a load of Doom's goons, uh, firing those laser rifles and also missiles at him. They do nothing, but it doesn't matter because it was a diversion. A diversion by Doom so he can unleash this big uh, robot on Superman. And it's no ordinary robot because it is made of an alloy nearly as indestructible as adamantium and it's powered by Doom's fusion reactor. During that little tussle, the parasite frees himself but then Spider-Man arrives to take him on. But in kicking the Parasite, he gives the Parasite some of his powers. So he's struggling with the Parasite. Superman is struggling with the robot until Spidey leaps onto the robot's head to distract him. And Superman, well, you can see what he does to the robot. With the robot out of the way, Superman now approaches Doom. But at that point, something happens. You remember earlier on when Superman was in Latveria and he was hit by an invisible particle beam. Well, the particles in that beam apparently were microscopic particles of kryptonite, and they were encased in minute uh, lead lining. They infused his clothing, he didn't even know about it. Now that he's in Doom's base, Doom has activated a ray that releases the kryptonite, and that, of course, takes Superman out of the game. Spider-Man, watching on, is also dealt with by the Parasite, who lays a hand on his shoulder and knocks him out. So it's not looking good for our heroes. Superman is unconscious, basically encased in kryptonite. In the stasis tubes, we have both the Hulk and Wonder Woman, and Spider-Man uh, is strapped up to the wall. Even if he was at full strength, he doubts he'd be able to break free from the bonds. At this point, we hear a bit more about Doom's plan for the Parasite. He's built a special harness for the Parasite, which he says will help him drain the power of all of those three superheroes. But what he actually intends to do is to keep force feeding the Parasite, especially Superman's power. It will overload him and it will change the Parasite's body into a, a mass of glowing crystal. That crystal will then be used to power the fusion reactor. This is Doom's plan, not mine. Spidey can't move, but he can fire his web shooters. And he fires them at the body of Superman. Doom and the Parasite don't notice this because they're busy uh, discussing their plans. Then what Spidey does is he pulls back his webs so it kind of peels off all of the kryptonite from Superman's inert body. Meanwhile, Doom 
is asking the parasite why it's taking him so long to put this special harness on. But you remember the parasite has absorbed some of Spider-Man's power. And as he goes to put the harness on, his spider sense goes off, telling him danger, it's a trap. He confronts Doom over this betrayal and punches him so he flies back into the control panel for the fusion reactor. At that point, our heroes are free and they join the fray. Whilst Spider-Man distracts the parasite, Superman grabs hold of Doom, who is about to escape. Strangely, he doesn't see that Doom is a threat at the moment, so he says, no, you're fine, I'll let you go. All I want is one of your gauntlets. And that's what he takes, and Doom wanders off. Then Superman confronts the parasite and uses the gauntlet to knock him out. Because if you remember, the gauntlet is insulated against the parasite's power. But there's an even bigger danger because the fusion reactor is about to go critical. Superman dives down beneath the ground to try to physically slow down that reaction. And he says it's up to Spider-Man to work out the controls to try to stop it going critical, to try to contain it. I don't know why Superman didn't do that bit, because apparently yet another one of his powers is super intelligence. Nonetheless, it's Spider-Man who has to work it out. Superman has to deal with temperatures of, as it says here, 30 million degrees. 30 million degrees. Ridiculous. Eventually, and somewhat inevitably, Spider-Man does work it out, and he stops the reactor from going critical. Now, Superman goes after Doom. Thanks to his boot jets, Doctor Doom has made it to the Latvian embassy just ahead of Superman. And seeing as it is sovereign soil, again, Superman won't trespass on that sovereign soil, he won't break the law, even if it is to apprehend Doctor Doom. From that point on, we just have a few loose ends to tie up. Both Clark Kent and Peter Parker return to their respective home cities, and we see Clark Kent explaining that Superman returned to the base, to Doom's base, freed Wonder Woman, uh, found that the Hulk was already missing, and to apprehend all of uh, Dr. Doom's goons. Back at the offices of the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson is overjoyed to see Peter Parker back. Not through any fondness for him, just that he finds Peter a lot easier to bully than he does Clark Kent. Thus, crisis has been averted and the status quo has been resumed. So there you have it. 62 pages of oversized comic. And it was really good fun. Don't get me wrong, the storyline didn't have any real depth to it, but this is 1981. Not many comic storylines did. Where the artwork is concerned, the larger format was used really well, really effectively, without falling back on the old classic double page spread that was used so much to pad out Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk at the Winter Olympics. It does highlight the difference between the two companies' heroes' power sets, but it's also quite fun to see how the public, especially police officers, react differently to the two main characters. The age of the Treasury edition was coming to an end, but it was ending in a flurry, because roughly the same time that this came out, DC ended its own Treasury format series with an equally impressive intercompany crossover between Batman and the Incredible Hulk. Now the age of the limited series was dawning, and that meant that Marvel could concentrate on creating its own in-house events with its own crossovers between its own characters.